Even if you're a newcomer to amateur radio, you're probably familiar with SSB single sideband. It's been around for a long time, but it wasn't always around. Originally, we had something called amplitude modulation, AM. So why did we progress to single sideband? How did it progress? And how do we use it today? Welcome to the Waters and Stanton video channel. The mode of SSB has been around for an awful long time. In fact, many of you will not remember anything other than single sideband. It's a very effective form of voice transmission. But in order to understand SSB and uh, how it was developed, it's interesting to go back to the days before we had SSB. Before we had SSB, we had AM, Amplitude Modulation, and that really was the first widely used form of voice transmission on the radio waves. And that goes back to the turn of 1900s, 1910, and so forth. But in fact, SSB goes back a long way as well. The first SSB demonstration was in 1914. But it wasn't until 1927 that SSB had some commercial use and it was used for long distance telephone calls, transatlantic telephone calls, but it wasn't used generally on the radio waves. We stuck to AM. The reason we stuck to AM was because it was very simple to receive. Even a crystal set, a diode and a pair of headphones and a tuned circuit and an antenna would receive AM signals. So AM was very popular. It also not only transmitted voice successfully, but it also transmitted music success successfully. So that's why AM really had a long life. And in fact, of course, it's still used today on the medium and long wave bands. All the transmissions on those frequencies are on AM and it's widely used around the world. Even on the shortwave bands, it's used extensively because it is a simple system to receive and most receivers will receive AM even today. So why did we introduce SSB? Well, the reason we introduced SSB was because it takes up far less space. So you can have a lot more channels and also it's very effective under weak signal conditions. So it has a very good application for communication where we're often dealing with weak signals and we're trying to resolve them in noisy conditions and so forth. That's where it really wins, but it is no good for music, which is why AM still continues today. Now whilst it was easy to receive AM transmissions, the transmitter side was not so easy, or at least it was very inefficient. The reason being because amplitude modulation comprises two main components. It comprises the carrier, which is a steady signal which has to be transmitted all the time, plus the modulation applied to it, which actually increases the power of the transmitter in sympathy with the audio applied to it. That means to say that the components of the transmitter have to be well rated because they are transmitting all the time. It's rather like today when we transmit FM or FT8. We have to bear in mind that that transmitter, those components in the transmitter, are working continually. They're generating power even when nothing's happening. Same with AM. Even when there's no signals, the AM transmitters are still generating a lot of power. And then we have to apply modulation to it, the music or the speech. Now, a popular way of applying modulation to an AM transmitter is to use what we call high level modulation, which means to say that the modulation is applied late in the transmitter chain. In fact, it's applied to the actual output stages of the transmitter, which means to say we have to have lots and lots of audio. The audio level needs to be almost as high as the transmitter power. So you can see the problem. You could apply low level modulation, but it means to say that everything has got to be run in a linear mode and we've got this constant steady power going through even when there's no modulation. So 
an AM transmitter is quite inefficient and it's quite demanding on the components, the valves, etc. So you can see that whilst receiving AM is very simple, the actual transmitter side, not complex in complexity state per se, but it is complex because of all the power it has to handle and all the component parts that need to produce both the steady signal and the audio applied to the transmission. So let's see how SSB was developed. I'm going to put up on the screen now um, a shot of an AM transmission I've taken from my uh, FT710 transceiver. And as you can see, basically there's two sidebands and there's a central frequency, the actual, actual fundamental frequency. And it's that central frequency that has the carrier, which is constantly there. So we've got two sidebands and a carrier. Now, the first thing that we can dispense with is the carrier. And if we null out the carrier, we then get rid of this constant power that the transmitter has to handle. And we end up with two sidebands, double sideband. And double sideband was actually used on the handbands uh, for a short period of time when SSB was being introduced. Because both those sidebands carry identical information, we can actually remove one. So we remove one of the sidebands and we're left with a single sideband, SSB. And that's how SSB works. We null out the carrier and we get rid of one of the sidebands. We've now got a very efficient transmission because the transmission channel width is no more than about, about three, three and a half kilohertz wide, whereas AM is give or take around about 10 kilohertz wide. So we've got an advantage. And when we work in narrow channels, we have narrow receiver channels as well. And as we narrow the receiver channel down, we enjoy better signal to noise ratio, which is one of the main reasons why SSB is very effective under weak signal conditions compared with the AM transmissions. But when we transmit SSB, we can't receive it on an old AM receiver. Now, the easy way to do it on the old AM receivers was to have what we call a BFO. Now, we use the BFO anyway to receive CW signals, so we've got a sort of an audio beat in the receiver. And what the BFO does, it replaces the carrier that's missing from the transmission. And then we can resolve the signal. Now, today's receivers um, don't have what we call a BFO. The, the basic receiver is designed so that it's designed to receive SSB. And although there is effectively a BFO in it, you, this, it's not a control, it's not a function on the receiver. Um, if you want to receive AM, switch over to AM, and it will receive AM signals as well. So the current receiver or transceiver, you can switch between AM and SSB. You must receive, you must switch to SSB if you want to receive SSB, and you, you don't actually have to switch to AM to receive AM because on an SSB receiver, you can zero, zero beat the AM signal, but it will be quite. Well, quite narrow banded and you won't get the full effect and it will be pretty awful for music. The first commercial SSB transmitter for handbands was introduced in the early 1950s, uh, an American design. But uh, SSB didn't become popular until the 60s on the handbands. Uh, uh, amateurs up until the uh, late 1950s were still using AM. Even today, of course, there are some amateurs that still use AM and it's an interesting mode to experiment with. But uh, we now widely use SSB on the HF bands. Of course, on the higher bands, on the VHF bands, we use FM. We use SSB as well, but we use FM for channelised communication. In the early days of SSB on the hand bands, a lot of the equipment was home built. I built my own uh, SSB generator and the most popular way was to use crystals. You generated the SSB at a low frequency. It was generally speaking in the the uh, popular IF chain 450 uh, kHz and used crystals to create a narrow pass band and another crystal to create the carrier before it was nulled and that was known as an exciter because 
what you actually did was once you built the SSB generator, you then mixed it with an oscillator to produce a signal on the chosen ham band. And if you wanted to change bands, you basically changed the oscillator. Later on, uh, there was a generation of SSB in the 9 MHz region, again with crystals. Phasing was an alternative system, which in some ways produced a better quality sound in SSB signal but it was quite difficult for home builders to build and it was also quite difficult, as I recall, to keep it stabilised and if it went out of phase you lost your SSB rejection and your carrier rejection etc etc. Um, the first uh, British uh, transmitter, I'm pretty sure, was the KW Viceroy and that originally was available as a low power, um, I think it was 80 metres through to, to um, 10 metres low power transmitter around about seven or eight watts and then they produced a higher powered one uh, in the states uh, i'm not sure what the, what the first transmitter was over there uh, certainly collins were very um, big uh, on ssb uh, later on um, a heath kit came along and of course kw then started to introduce the transceiver because in the early days of ssb we had separate transmitters and separate receivers and generally speaking you built your ssb transmitter come what may and then you used a normal am receiver with a bfo to to receive the signals it worked quite well uh, but of course uh, as time went on the transceivers were introduced and of course we're up to the present day now where it's very unusual to have a separate transmitter and receiver. And today the SSB signal has been uh, very well um, refined, or the design has been very well refined. The typical bandwidth is around about 2.8 kilohertz. 3 kilohertz is usually the maximum. You can go above that, but of course it's not particularly band friendly. Uh, you want to keep your bandwidth down to uh, uh, 3 kilohertz. 3 kilohertz or below that and of course the trans transmitter section is very efficient because there's only power going through when you speak into the microphone don't have the problem we had with the old AM days where we had a continuous carrier going and the SSB tuning SSB in is very simple although if you've never tried tuning SSB in before you may well find that uh, you're not quite sure what you do but it doesn't take more than a few minutes to uh, suss out how to tune in an SSB signal. I find that for, for the beginner, I find that if you're um, tuning LSB, LSB is from the low frequency bands up to, um, uh, I think it's that there's the official 10 megahertz cutoff. So all bands up to uh, 7 megahertz are LSB. And I find that if you are learning to tune in SSB it's easier if you go from high to low in other words if you, go, if you stop at the you start at the top of the 40 meter band and tune down you'll find tuning in those signals becomes much more easy much more natural than going in the opposite direction And the reverse happens when you go uh, to the higher bands. Uh, the first um, SSB band would be 14 megahertz, and 40 megahertz up, which is upper side band, then it, you'll find it easier if you start at the bottom of the band and tune up. Once you've got the knack of it, of course, you can tune anywhere at all, whichever way you like. One thing I would say is that SSB is not channelized and some of the newcomers seem to think that SSB is channelized because I've had a number of QSOs where uh, I've been asked what frequency I'm on and I've read the frequency off and the guy says, oh yes, I thought you were off frequency. And they, 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 they believe that SSB is channelized. Now SSB on ham radio bands is not channelized at all. It never has been, I don't suppose it ever will be. Um, if you feel like um, tuning in, if you feel like adjusting your frequency to a, a precise um, one kilohertz step or whatever pleases you, there's no problem there, and you can call CQ, etc. But don't expect all SSB signals to be 
on a particular channel. Channels, channels are used uh, to arrange skeds and it's quite normal to say I'll meet you on 7.150 uh, megahertz which is a, a sort of a nice round number but it doesn't mean to say that that station will be definitely there because that frequency might be used so you usually say plus or minus 5 or plus or minus 10 kilohertz so SSB is not channelized and don't be surprised if a lot of operators are just on a sort of a, a random number that, that random number is because they found a space on the band I mean 40 meters is not particularly wide band uh, so uh, it's a question of finding a space and just making sure that the channel's not in use and then calling CQ or whatever the, whatever uh, you want to do now as I said right at the outset SSB is very good for weak signal communication and a lot of operators will operate QRP um, QRP I think is officially known as 5 watts and down uh, 5 watts on SSB will get you a long way and in fact again when I was first uh, on SSB I used to run about 5 or 6 watts and used to work all over the place with that uh, power of course one has to be fair um, in the early days of SSB all stations were running fairly low power and the tendency has been in recent times to increase the power which means to say the competition increases so if you were running five or six watts of SSB in 1962 you'd have probably had no problem at all in working all over the world you might struggle a bit now but of course today the standard base station transceiver is fixed at 100 watts so it means to say that if you're running QRP you have got competition and of course it's very easy these days to add a linear amplifier and of course in the UK we fully expect the endorsement of for Ofcom to confirm that we will be able to run a kilowatt of power so there's a lot of competition there and gradually over the years the power has risen but nevertheless SSB is still very very good for weak signal communication so there we are. I hope that's uh, given you some background on SSB and uh, it's a fascinating mode. It's a mode, of course, that if you're a newcomer, you don't know any different. It's always been around. It's like my grandchildren. They pick up an iPad as if it's normal, whereas to people my age, an iPad is an amazing thing. So there we are. Anyway, thank you for watching this channel. Thank you for your support. Much appreciated. Thank you for your support at the shop and on the website etc etc don't forget we've got uh, a new website now we've also got a new blog uh, go onto our front page top right you'll see a um, menu item for the video blog and that will be populated gradually over the next few weeks there we are in the meantime enjoy ham radio you take care and as usual i look forward to seeing you in the next video bye for now